Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat. Welcome, and uh, we're really so happy to see you all here. Uh, this is not the day I expected it would be, so um, it is the Shemini Atzeret, the day of our joy, the day the joy continues after the seven days of joy that we've uh, just gone through with Sukkot. But this day is to be the day of our eternal joy. This is the eighth day. And as you will see as we go through this Torah portion, uh, of course, who, who would have had any idea that Israel would be in war? On this day, the eighth day, which points to a new beginning. And as we go through this Torah portion, I just want to say up front, the Lord really had his hand on this lesson because I had no intentions of teaching what we're going to teach today. But he apparently had all the intentions that we were going to teach this. So when I woke up and learned that Israel was in war, I was shocked because this war is pointing to the new beginning that we are about to go through and enter into. And there's no question about it. So as we go into this lesson, keep that in mind. Everything about this day is pointing to a new beginning. The number eight always represents that new beginning. And here we are in Shemini Atzeret. And nobody, not even the IDF, expected this war. And they're the best in the world. And it surprised them. And so it is a surprise to all of us. But here we are. So I want to say welcome and thank all of you for tuning in out there. Uh, we love and appreciate you, and we hope that your joy has been amazing through this uh, time of Sukkot. And as we continue today, we pray your joy overflows, even as we are grieving for what's going on in Israel. It's a time, it's great, and it's terrible exactly like the Lord said it would be. It's great and terrible. This is all pointing to that day when you run out of words to describe it. And they're opposite ends of the spectrum, great and terrible. You don't want to see people suffer, but you want to see the eternal kingdom come. And that's what we're going to see. So today we're going to look at the opening words of the blessing that Moses is blessing the children of Israel with. And we're going to see that this blessing, though I never would have dreamt, is 100% prophetic. It is speaking of this very day. And now I can really say it with surety. It is absolutely speaking of this very day. We're going to look at some very specific things. We're going to look at the fact that there's a phrase used in this blessing called man of war, a man of God. What does that mean? man of God. And then we're going to look at Sinai and Seir, which it says the Lord comes from Sinai and he comes from Seir. Well, those are two specific places and they're not the same. How can he do that? We're going to look at that. We're going to look at who are all these saints that are coming when he's only blessing Israel. Is it Israel alone? or is someone else included? And then we're going to look at what is the heritage of Jacob. That's how this blessing begins. And it's the heritage of Jacob. So who does that involve? Are we involved in that? But I will tell you now, everything is about the days that we are living with. And our Torah por portion opens with Deuteronomy 33.1. Now this really important words, is the blessing with which Moses, man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. So the two words, now this, are the first two words in Hebrew of this Torah portion, which are vezot, and this. Now who cares, right? Well, I'll tell you how amazingly important those two words are. 
because here we see Moses is continuing in the tradition that Jacob started. Remember when Jacob was dying, what did he do? He blessed all the children of Israel, all the heads of the tribes before they died. And the final words of Jacob were, and this is the blessing. And Moses picks it right up as though there hadn't even been a break. And he says, and this is the blessing. So Moses picks up that blessing that Jacob had given with the same words Jacob ends with, Moses opens with. So they're completely connected, all right? We're gonna see how death interrupts leaders, but Vezot is very important. So Jacob ends the blessing with Vezot, and this is the blessing, and Moses starts his blessing with Vezot, and this is the blessing. So Jacob blessed them, as the children of Israel, as they began their existence as a nation. That's when Jacob blessed them. And they were going to go to Egypt, a foreign place where they would be slaves and grow in number. So you wouldn't think that was a blessing, but it was. And Moses is blessing them as they begin their existence as a nation in the land that he promised to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so both of these blessings begin with the Israelites going in and becoming greater. All right, these are cycles. And after Jacob pronounced the blessing on the tribes, he died, as we're told in Genesis 49:33. And when Jacob had finished commanding his sons, he drew his feet up into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Then Joseph also dies in, in Genesis 50, 24 and 26. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. So Joseph died, being 110 years old, and he, they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. The next great leader to come after Joseph was Moses, okay? And Moses prepares to die after he blesses the sons of Israel. Now, in a few minutes, we're gonna just look at the cycles of the death of great righteous leaders and see how they lead to the next great move of God. But I just want that little thought in your mind, okay? Deuteronomy 33.1 then goes on to say, uh, now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, and I'm gonna stop there. Moses was the only person in Torah to be called the man of God. And he's called man of God six times. Why is that? All right, there is one other time, not in Torah, but in the entire Tanakh when this term man of God is actually used. And it's referring, it's not referring to Moses. It's referring to one other person who's gonna be tied in with Moses. So what's this one other time when man of God is used? It's when the angel of the Lord appeared to Samson's mother and to Manoah, his father. Now, Let's see why this is significant. We're gonna read this little story, Judges 13, three, six, eight through 22. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, indeed, now you are, a bar you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. So the woman came and told her husband saying, a man of God came to me and his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. Very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. 
Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah and the angel of God came to the woman again as she was seen in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Then the woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. So Manoah arose and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said to him, You, are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? Manoah said, Now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you, and we will prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Counselor, mighty God. I'll, yes, there you go. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord. And he did a, a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. Okay? So who was this angel of the Lord? It was no less than a pre-incarnate vision or visitation from the Lord to the parents of Samson. And why is this important? Because Moses declares in Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So M Moses was called man of God six times, right? Only one other time was that phrase used, and it was pointing specifically to Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. No question about it, because he was going to be the prophet like Moses. So these are little hidden things that you got to dig out. And here it is right here for us. So pretty incredible. And now Moses blessing begins. Now that we know who this man is, that's giving this blessing. Okay. Now this is the blessing in Deuteronomy 33, one through three, with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone from Mount Paran. All right, I want to just look at, this was given before Moses' death. All right, this is really important because it's so interesting to connect this with the coming of the Messiah. As all significant deaths of righteous leaders, okay, these are the deaths of righteous leaders lead to the next big chapter of the history of God's people. 
So when a very righteous, noted leader dies, you know that the Lord's turning the page and something else is about now to unfold in his plan for all eternity. So the next leader we know was Joshua, right? Joshua was a great leader. He took the people into the land. They conquered and Joshua kept them on the track of following God. He was a great leader. And when Joshua dies, it says in Judges 17, 6, in those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so things began to decay because there was no great leader. Okay. So then what does God do? He brings Samuel onto the scene. Samuel's a great leader and Samuel works in the lives of Saul and David who are kings. So now Israel does have kings. God raised kings up. Saul, not good. David had his issues and Samuel worked with both of them. He was brought up to work with these kings that were going to be kings over Israel. Then David dies. He, that's definitely the death of a very righteous leader. And what happens? His son Solomon builds the temple. Huge. So we see a pattern clear up to the point when the prophets stop prophesying, right? They all die. They are all righteous men of God. And what happens? God goes silent for 400 years and Israel suffers under leadership of foreign nations. Greece and Rome come in there. Israel is suffering. Then God sends the man of God that we read about that showed himself to Manoah and his wife. Of course, it's Yeshua. And what is he doing? He brings the kingdom of God with him, right? He says the kingdom is among you. So this was, this was a huge turn of the page, all right? So this verse in Deuteronomy, or these verses, are painting a very prophetic picture for us. But you have to take the time to go and say, Okay, so Moses is dying. What does this mean to us? This is what it means. After Moses died, this prophet like him that everything is pointing to comes. But it was a long stretch between Moses and Yeshua. And then Yeshua dies. We know he rose and went back to heaven. And he left the kingdom of God in whose hands? Mm -hmm. In our hands. And he said, okay, you take this kingdom and make it grow. Now it's in your hands. It's up to you. Has there been a great leader worldwide that has led the, the kingdom of God since Yeshua went into heaven? No, there has not. It's up to us. That's how much he's trusted us. And here we are today waiting his return when he will rule and reign. And this is why we rejoice even as times get worse. It's not that we're rejoicing because times are getting bad opposite. We hate that, right? I mean, it's horrible to watch our nation crumble. It's horrible to watch Israel go into war. But we know that these things are happening because his kingdom is coming. So this is really now a, the point of the story that we're going to go around today. And it's in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. 
and it says, we are going from glory to glory. So reading it, it says, but we with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Okay, so what is this talking about? How is this connected? I find it very interesting that the first part of these verses is talking about having open faces. What does that mean? If you have an open face, it is the Greek word anakalupto, all right? Anakalupto means to unveil your face to uncover it so that something can be disclosed to you, so that you can see something more clearly and understand what is happening. All right, and this is the amazing thing. Once lifted, once you see what is being disclosed, once this veil is raised and now you have 20-20 vision and get it, then the veil remains lifted forever. This truth that's coming into your understanding is not going to go away. All right, so we see that happening. So we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. So, however, this Greek tense doesn't refer to a one-time unveiling, but to a veil that once is lifted remains forever. All right. He's lifting the veil for us today. This day, I cannot possibly put into words how incredibly significant it is. This is Shemini Atzeret. This is the day of our eternal joy when the new kingdom is ushered in forever and ever. And on this day, God allows a war to erupt in Israel, really an unprecedented war, because the IDF is on top of this kind of stuff. They are so good, but they didn't see this coming. This is heading towards something huge. This is lifting the veil if we are going to see it. So, <laughs> uh, this is the time of our joy. At the same time, it is very difficult because Satan knows his time is short and the systems of the world are dying. All right. Is there a great leader at this time dying? No. Now we've gone from leadership to world systems that are dying. And that's what we're seeing happening. Does that mean that Israel is going to die? No. But their system of government is going to be taken down, just like all other systems of government in the world are taken down prior to the coming of the Lord. All right. So I don't want to miss something here. So what are we supposed to dwell on? We're supposed to dwell on going from glory to glory, seeing his plan be unveiled, that he's showing it to us, that he's told us about it. All right. So from this, then we change our perspective. That's what has to happen. We don't go around with mopey faces, sad hearts, though, yes, it's the great and terrible day. And of course, we grieve what's awful that lives are perishing. It's, it's, nobody wants to see that. But we change our perspective from getting joy from the circumstances on earth. That's not where we're going to get our joy from anymore to getting our joy from the circumstances that he told us were going to come because we're citizens of heaven. So we have to see our citizenship changed, even though it changed a long time ago, right? But we're still very fleshly people, aren't we? Our feet are firmly connected to terra firma, earth. 
right? And it's just a natural thing. It's not that it's bad or it doesn't make us bad, but it's something that we have to change our perspective. And I hope that I'm right now at, so the time of our joy comes because we yearn for this eternal kingdom to come. So we're going up. We're making Aliyah each time there's a death of one of God's righteous servants and he turns the page to the next higher level of his plan. And 2 Corinthians says we have these open faces now we can see. And then it says we are changed. The word changed is Greek for meta morpho, which is a compound word. So there's two meanings in it. Meta means we exchange something. Okay. There's an exchange that's going to go on. And morpho means that we are transformed by this change or there's a transfiguration happening both outside and inside. And really it comes from the inside first and affects your outward appearance. All right. So it changes how we actually think. So it takes our, our attention from the horrible news that we see on the TV every day. I don't know about you. I turned on the news the other day, if you even watch it. And I just saw hordes of people crossing the border. And they don't know. They have no place to go. They've been told something. I don't know what they've been told. But I'm sure they're expecting this life in America to be amazing. And I saw one of those poor people, a man from Venezuela, interviewed and he said, well, my life was better in Venezuela. At least I had a home and I had food and now I've come here and I have nothing and I'm sleeping on the sidewalk. So they've been given a hope that is not realistic. No nation can care for the number of people coming over our border. It's not that we're cruel. It's that it's impossible. Not, there was no plan for this. So how do we help these people? We can't. All right. So, but this verse says we're going to have a metamorphosis. We, when this veil is lifted, we're going to have our mind transformed as to what is happening. Are our foundations crumbling in this nation and all over the world? Yes. And is it terrible? Yes. But it's also great. And so the Lord is raising us up for these days. And that verse in 2 Corinthians tells us how. He's lifting the veil. He's transforming the way we think from those people that get their joy from the earth to those people that get their joy from the coming kingdom, the kingdom of heaven that is right here living in us. So it's not that we can't access it. It's with us at all times. All right. So this word metamorpho to change is used only in the new covenant, the Brit Hadashah. And it appears in Matthew 17 too. And it says, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. And this we know is about Sukkot. We mentioned this last week. It's about the end coming again. It's when his kingdom is being set up. So when he was shining with all this light, it was because his king, it's a picture of his kingdom that is here on earth when he returns. And so he's transformed and he will transform all of us in this world into that new body, into this new government that he will rule and reign from. Now that is joyful. I don't know if any of you wake up with a backache or sinuses <laughs> and allergies, but we're not going to have those anymore. <laughs> and all the other issues that we deal with, those are going to be in the past. Right now they're forming and shaping us. And 2 Corinthians says, he is opening our understanding and telling us how we have this joy. 
So Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what is his perfect will? What is it? Have you ever asked yourself that? Well, 1 Chronicles 16, 27 gives us a clue. It says, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Well, are we supposed to live in, in his place? Does he live in us? His very presence is in us. So his strength and his joy surround us. This is amazing. Psalm 511 says, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exalt in you. And we pray that for Israel today. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of what? Joy. Joy. All right. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you see the focus of our thinking have, have to change? It has to go up so that we can take the joy into the world because they're not happy and they, they don't know where to look for it. This, it's time to build the kingdom. 1 Kings 8.66 says, On the eighth day, this is this day, Shemini Atzeret, that's the eighth day. He, he, the king, sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and went to their homes joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had shown to David his servant and to Israel his people on the eighth day. Shemini Atzeret, the day of new beginnings. This is after the party of Sukkot, which lasts for seven days, but the joy is still going on. I read the other day that during Shemini Atzeret, the singing and the dancing got even louder, and they, they didn't stop dancing the whole entire 24-hour period. Now, that's my kind of a day. I like to dance. <laughs> so um, this is our joy. Think of it. That's what's coming. It represents our eternal joy. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So we know that we're going into a dark season, but it's not that that we're going to focus on. We focus on the joy that comes in the morning. So there's no doubt that the word changed in 2 Corinthians speaks of an actual, real transformation of our minds, even our outward appearance. You know, when you feel down and worried and all the other adjectives we could put in there, it affects your countenance, doesn't it? It affects how you look on the outside. And when you have that joy and that expectancy, that affects our appearance too. So the Holy Spirit lets us know through Paul that we actually can exchange our present way of thinking or our current status for that more glorious way of thinking. This is the blessing. We go from glory to glory. That's amazing. No other people is this set of but us. We go from glory to glory. So then it says in Deuteronomy 33, 2, the word came from Sinai and dawned from Seir. Oh my gosh, that word dawned. I hadn't even seen it until right this second. It means there's going to be a light that comes when the Lord comes from Seir, okay? Get that picture in your brain. And he shone forth from Mount Paran. So, three names are all mentioned in that one part of verse 2. And they're all in connection with where the Lord came from and where he's going to come from. And so how is it possible that he's coming from two places? That is the question that we need to ask. 
All right, it's well agreed on that Sinai and Paran are the same place, one in the same. They both refer to Mount Sinai, okay? But Seir is not Sinai. Seir is Edom. We're going to see that in a minute in the scriptures. And Seir is strongly connected to Rome. All right? And I'll show you how in a second. What's important about Seir? We see Seir in Deborah's song. Deborah was a judge and a prophet prophetess in Israel and she said in Judges 5 4 through 6 when you Lord went out from Seir when you marched from the land of Edom all right same place the earth shook she's telling us what's going to happen when the Lord comes from Seir all right the earth is going to shake the heavens are going to pour. The clouds poured down water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. Earthquakes, rains that are probably bringing floods. Deborah's seen these things when? When the Lord comes from Seir or Edom, which relates to Rome. All right, now we need to ask another question. We can put the PowerPoint up. You already did. I love it when you're ahead of me. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see. There are Seir and Edom are two names for the same place, and they allude to Rome. It's important to understand that we see Seir and Edom connected to Rome because of Daniel's prophecy. Now this, this, you'll get this in a second. Remember the Lord gave Daniel this prophecy and he showed him this statue. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world that were going to rule, right? Okay, so where are we now? We're here. This is where the Lord has been trapped, if you will. Now, hang in here with me for a second, because not everybody is going to have heard this before. He's been trapped in Rome for 2,000 years. What am I talking about? He's been trapped there with the wrong identity. All right? The identity of the Lord Yeshua, the Christ, has been what? that he was basically a Gentile, right? Is he? No. no. He's the Savior, yes, but he's not a Gentile. He is a Jewish man. He came as a Jewish man. He brought the gospel as a Jewish man. He died on the cross as a Jewish rabbi. He's coming back King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He was called King of the Jews. Remember over his cross, they put that sign, King of the Jews? Okay, so from Rome came this wrong identity of who he was, and it caught on. Constantine and all those other guys that sent out how we should worship him and who he really was, all these wrong understandings are being corrected as we speak. We're here because those wrong understandings have been corrected in our hearts and minds, right? We've seen it. The Lord lifted the veil for us. Now we're going to lift the veil for other people so they can see he's coming back as king of the Jews. But I'll show you how we're part of all of that, too. It's incredible. So when Deborah says... When you, Lord, went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook. That's going to be those hard times when the earth is shaking. Heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. So 
This is just showing us the cyclical nature of the kingdoms of the earth. We've seen them all collapse. We're coming to the final collapse of the system of Rome, which is basically, you know, ruled since that time. And what's the very last one coming? It's the seven year period. And what's going to happen during that seven year period? The stone comes from heaven and crushes that kingdom. That's the days that we're going into. Everybody under, see, uh, see that and understand it? I know this is new for some, but I hope you're, you're getting it. So this is why the whole world is in chaos. It has to be. Because this kingdom, this last one before the final seven years is coming down. The Lord's coming out of Edom. He's coming out of that understanding that he's a Gentile, blue-eyed, you know, whatever. God, he's not. <laughs> All right, this is why Isaiah 63.1 says, Who is this coming from Edom? All right, from Basra with his garment stained crimson. Who is this robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? Well, who's that describing? Yes. Yeshua. There is nobody else that can fit that description. It's him that's coming from Edom or Seir, which are the same, and they are the same as Rome. All right. And he says, uh, it is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Who else can say that but Yeshua? Whose garments are stained with red? Only Yeshua's. All right. And so now he's coming in strength, leaving Edom. He is not coming as gentle Jesus, meek and mild, riding on that little donkey. Oh, no. This time he's coming on the horse. That means he's coming for battle. When a king rides a horse into a town, they're coming with swords drawn for battle. He came the first time riding on a donkey to bring peace. Okay, that's over. Now he's coming to bring battle. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He's going to rejoice over you with singing. Picture that. That is the most beautiful picture in the world to me. Though the earth is quaking, He's not sitting in the heavens, wringing his hands, worried about what he's going to do. Oh, no. He's taking great delight in us, his people, who want to take his light out. And that is supposed to be contagious. If he is singing over us, what should our response be to him? Praise oh, yeah. Hard to even talk about. But... There is a true story I want to read to you, and it talks about joy in the hardest of circumstances. And um, I'm just going to read it because it's pretty amazing. It's kind of tough, but it's really amazing. Blumenthal records this story of the massacre of a large group of Hasidic Jews in Lublin, a city that was a great center of yeshiva study before the Second World War. The brutal local Nazi commander had them assembled outside the city limits where they were assaulted by his dogs and beaten. Then he ordered them to sing of one of their Hasidic songs, and he made it very specific. He said, mocking their teachings, that it is a great mitzvah to do a good deed, to be joyous always. So he's mocking them. Uh, and so he said, sing me a song, sing the song about joy, that you always have joy. Go ahead, sing it. And so again, he said, go ahead, it's a great mitzvah, rejoicing always. And who echoed this? Apostle Paul echoed this, or Rabbi Shaul, who also came from a great yeshiva. And that is why he wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Okay, so 
uh, they, they began singing. But how could they sing under such circumstances? The commander resumed the attacks. Then a trembling voice rose in the familiar Yiddish melody saying, let us be reconciled, be reconciled to our Father in heaven. And that song soon faded. Then a stronger voice picked up the melody, but with new words. And this voice sang, we will outlive them, outlive them, our Father in heaven. As the song spread, the Hasidic, Hasidim started dancing and singing with zeal inspired from heaven. The Nazi commander yelled and screamed in an effort to stop them. This was more than he could take, but he could not stop them. They paid a heavy price, but the singing and dancing did not stop. They gave up their lives, but their spirits overcame and indeed will eternally outlive the spirit of the enemies of God and his people, those Jews, fortified their physical survival as did so many others, including those in the underground who attempted to resist with forth, force. Blumenthal concludes, resistance, military and spiritual was necessary. Pride in our God was necessary. Do we have pride in our God? That's a big question. They had pride in their God. On October 3rd this year, just this past Tuesday, it was Tishri 18th on God's calendar, the middle of Sukkot. These were some of the things that occurred. <laughs> The stock market lost 430 points. The NASDAQ lost 248 points. Um, amidst all of this, unions are striking. Inflation is going up. The borders are open. Surging violence on our streets and on and on. The Speaker of the House was voted out, meaning everything involving government stopped. Uh, <laughs> Larry Kudlow has a program on TV. He came on and all this was happening. And he said, and as far as I know, he's not a religious man, but his words were, today is apocryphal, <laughs> apocryphal. And then Biden came on and said, this is the last gasp of mega Republicans. Isn't that interesting? Uh, we're in the birth pangs of Hevle Mashiach. He is coming. So then another well-respected program, uh, one of the talking heads said, it was really serious. It was such a serious day. I knew it. I told my husband, something huge is happening, but I don't know what. Well, now we know today was coming. But this is what this person said. Today, we are seeing our country go down like Rome, who also was totally corrupt, whose debt was out of control, and who was involved in too many wars. This was not a religious person. But even the world knows that we're not in normal times. But we are going from what? Glory to glory. The veil has been lifted off our face. He is rejoicing over us and we can rejoice in him. Deuteronomy 33, one through three. Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran and he came with 10,000s of his saints. From his right hand came a fiery law for them. Yes, he loves the people. All his saints are in your hand. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. And now Moses adds that he came with 10,000s of his saints. 
Well, when does this happen? Jude tells us. This little tiny one chapter book is huge. It's the last page before the book of Revelation. That's not a mistake. Listen to what Jude 1.14 says. And Enoch, who was Enoch? Enoch was the great grandfather of Noah. All right? He was translated. He never died. Enoch heard from the Lord. All right? So we need to listen to what Enoch said. He knew something. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And Zechariah adds what will be happening at this time. Zechariah 14, 5. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all his saints with him. All right. At the beginning of this blessing, we're told that Moses is blessing the children of Israel. Right? Did we remember that part? And now it says in Deuteronomy 33, 2b and 3, And he came with ten thousands of his saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yes, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand, and they sat down at thy feet, and everyone shall receive thy words. So this raises a question. Moses began this blessing, blessing the children of Israel. Now the language changes. The Lord's putting these words in his mouth. And now this blessing is going to all the people, all the people. Now, are we being included in the blessing? And the answer is 1 Corinthians 1-2. Yes. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Messiah Yeshua, saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Yeshua the Messiah, their Lord and ours. Do you hear that vocabulary? We're not excluded. We are right in there. We are saints also. He is their Lord and ours, Jews and Gentiles, all his people. Romans 1, 7, whoo, to all who are beloved of God in Rome as called, what? Saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. When Moses said he loves the people, all the saints are in his hand, he was speaking to all of us. This prophecy was for us, not just the people standing there that day. So the true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who we have called our God, that's who all the people are. That's who the saints are. We're in this number. Revelation makes this clear in chapter 12, which talks about the woman. Who's the woman? The woman is Israel. And we'll see that as we read these verses. So she's the one who has the male child. Who brought forth Yeshua? Mary. Mary as the woman, but it also refers to Israel. Without Israel, Yeshua could not have been born. So when it says the woman in Revelation, it's really referring to Israel. So we'll read these verses and see this. All right, so Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. So who does this include? It includes everybody who's come to faith in Yeshua. 
And you have a testimony of that faith, Jew and Gentile, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. Who's he enraged with? Israel. Israel. That's why their war is raging there today, a vicious, horrible war. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. This is, do you get this language? She's birthed other children too. Who are they? They're the ones who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach. All of us. So Moses takes us to the time of the tribulation and now connects all of this with the people, the saints, us. Finally, Deuteronomy 33, 4 says, Moses commanded a law for us, and these are the important words, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob. Moses brought us the teaching of the Lord, also called the law, and Yeshua came to teach us how to live it out. Okay, so that the law, he said, would never be done away with. This law was also the heritage of the congregation of Jacob. Now watch this. So the question becomes, what is the heritage of Jacob? What is it? Yes, we should know this since we now see we are included in this blessing. Jacob had a hard life. This is the inheritance of Jacob. Jacob had a tough life. He had to leave his family after his father had blessed him. Yes, he tricked his father. He blessed Jacob instead of Esau. So he had to leave his family. He was tricked by his uncle into marrying the wrong daughter. He lived with the jealousies created by this competition between these two sisters, Leah and Rachel. He believed his favorite son, Joseph, had been eaten by wild beasts. And he mourned for Joseph all those years. Any of this sound familiar in your life? Have you had trouble with your family? Have you had issues that just cause you grief? Well, that's because we're part of the heritage of Jacob. His life was not easy. His beloved Rachel died giving birth to his last son. And Jacob prophesied of the last days. Remember when he gave the blessings and he prophesied of Yeshua's coming and he said to Judah in Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh, which is another name for Yeshua HaMashiach, comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people. He prophesied this. That was part of the blessing he gave, they zot habraka. So Jacob's life was difficult to say the least, it was. And amazing as our heritage also is. There's a famous rabbi who said, this is the heritage of Jacob who discovered that you can find God not just when you are peacefully tending your sheep or joining others in prayer in your church or in your synagogue, but also when you are in danger, far from home, with peril in front of you and fear behind you. That's when we have to understand we're part of the heritage of Jacob. This means that even in hard times, he is still our shepherd. We know the outcome that Jacob had. And from those who would, from these times will come times of praise. Because in these times when he's returning, he's dancing over us with joy because these will turn into times when our hands will be on the necks of our enemies. They are not going to triumph over us, not at all. And finally, Isaiah 58 has a lot to say about the heritage of Jacob. I encourage you all to read it. But I just want to look right now at Isaiah 58, 13 and 14, which says, 
and this is all about the heritage of Jacob. So, so it says, if you turn away your foot from the Shabbat, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath or the Shabbat a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and he will, listen to this, cause you to ride on the hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So the heritage of Jacob is both difficult and glorious. So summing up Deuteronomy 33, one through four, we can say Moses was the man of God who pointed to the only other one called man of God, the prophet who would be like him, Yeshua, the Messiah. He blessed the children of Israel, and we are included in that incredible blessing. The Lord came from Sinai, yes, where he gave the law. And he's coming from Seir, which is also Edom in Rome, and represents the place where Messiah is leaving behind his wrong identity leaving that place. The, and also the Lord is coming with 10,000s of his saints. He loves the people, all of his saints, which includes the believing Gentiles. And we have a heritage, the heritage of Jacob, whose difficult life shows us that, and this rabbi continues the same thought. The heritage of Jacob means that faith is a wrestling match. Do you ever feel like you're in a wrestling match? You hang on, you believe, you... As we struggle with our doubts and hesitations, above all, with fear. And he says fear is called the imposter syndrome. We are not given a spirit of fear, but power and love and a sound mind. If we have fear, it's the imposter syndrome. I love that. That we are not as big as people think we are or as God wants us to be. But out of such experiences, we, like Jacob, can emerge limping. Yet, it is out of such experiences that we too can discover that we have been wrestling with an angel who faces us to a, who forces us, I'm sorry, who forces us to a strength we did not know we had. That's the heritage of Jacob. He forces us into it. When we wrestle with these things that are human, this is our heritage. We are overcomers, as Jacob was. The Lord will cause us to overcome until he arrives on this planet. He will. And we will dance and sing in the face of our enemies. We go from what? Glory to glory. This is our joy, and that is our core portion. <laughs> Thank you.